that you're teaching us in these last days. Truly, the end is upon us, and Lord, you're in our midst, restoring all things. Lord, today, as we begin to look at the word, we ask you, O God, by your spirit and by the word, to cut out of us all false doctrine, all the lies we've been told, the religion, and all the things we've passed through to come to this place. Father God, we've passed through a lot. We've all come from different directions. We've all met at this one place, O God, where, we, where you bring us back to the Lordship of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, this day as we hear the word of God, it be new to us, fresh to us. And help it, help it to give us an understanding of just how deep and how strong and the delusions that come from the throne of hell are. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans chapter 7 is what we're going to spend a lot of time today in this class, in this session. This is the sixth tape and the sixth videotape on the book of Romans. This chapter, Romans 7, is the chapter where, like 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, where we came up with a lie about carnal Christ- Christianity. And when we begin to have our eyes open as sheep, we begin to discover there never was any such monster in God's kingdom as a carnal Christian. And that if there was such a thing as a carnal Christian, that all carnal Christians go to hell. And that therefore Matthew 7 is written to all who claim to be carnal Christians. That the Lord will say to many he never knew them, depart from them because they were workers of iniquity, which means they continue to walk in sin. And so when we begin to really look at 1 Corinthians 3 in the light of the Holy Spirit and what Paul was saying to us, we discovered that a lot of us held on to these lies in order to commit sin and still fill a place of security. Well, Romans 7 is almost just like that. Romans 7 is one of the chapters where all the Calvinists get their doctrines of election and once saved, always saved, and all these lies that have taken over every and have penetrated every doctrinal, every denomination that's known in America. It's from the seventh chapter. They totally ignore the sixth chapter about wrecking ourselves dead to sin. Romans 6 is totally cut out of their hearts when it comes to their doctrines of we're going to commit sin and we can't lose it. So Romans 7 is a chapter that they use. They take it like most doctrines are that are in error, out of just one or two verses, out of context, in order to make it um, amplify what they want to do from their own hearts. And of course we've already seen so far that God will give us over to any delusion that we choose to follow. But before we go into the seventh chapter, let's make sure that we remember what we saw in the last class meeting. We notice in Romans 6, Paul gave us some definite instructions concerning our walk of purity and our walk of salvation. And just like that, let's just look at it. For example, he says to us, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin? That's in the very first verse. Are we, talking about the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, to continue in sin that grace may abound? I want to remind you of something. Paul is preaching the gospel. He says in beginning this book that he was ashamed of the gospel because it was the power of God. Can you say amen to that? Unto salvation. To all who believe, he said. So when he begins to talk about this narrow walk and about dying to sin, he's talking still about the gospel. And we recognize the gospel. Again, from Paul's own definition, in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, is the death and the burial and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the last session, we took it from what he talked about, when he talked about glorying in the cross. We took one of the words he made, in the book of Galatians, and saw very clearly, he said, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in the cross. The cross, what, his own cross? No. He said, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember that class? Remember that in the last session? Well, when we come to the seventh chapter, Paul gives us what he went through in dying to all sin and rebellion. In fact, you might put Romans 7 this way, and we'll look at scripture talking about that. We will look at it. You might say he's literally saying to us the process of what he was talking about over there in Philippians 2.12 when he said, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He's describing here a working out of evil and bondages and sin habits and oppressions and temptations 
and all the vices and the wiles of Satan that had been controlling his life before he really came to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, see, Paul was a very religious man. He said concerning the law, he was perfect. You start to think about that. But at that point, he was trying to do it in the power of his own strength. Well, we're going to see here very clearly that he's going to describe to us this process and how hard and difficult it was for him to be free. In fact, he described the process to be so difficult, he let us know very clearly that without the Lord Jesus Christ doing it all, that it is totally impossible for us to be free. In fact, he goes on and talks about what a wretched person he was, what a wretched fellow he was. It's good to hear us pray now when we begin to pray and not, you know, just pray religiously. You know, Lord, deliver me from evil and Lord, cause me to hate evil and I hate myself and I hate these things in me. That's what Paul was saying in the seventh chapter of Romans. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. He was miserable because he knew the right way. At the same time, he saw that he did not have the power within his own ability to fulfill the requirements of the narrow way in order to be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. So in this sixth chapter in our last section, Paul told us very clearly in the third verse, he said, that we have been baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ, have been baptized into his death. Remember that? And so because he told us that, he said to us that in the fourth verse, therefore we should be living in the newness of life. Talking about while we're in the earth living in eternal life. Remember what he said in the fourth verse? He said our lives in verse 5 should be almost exactly in the type and likeness of God's resurrection from the dead. Now when Paul talks about being raised from the dead here, folks, he's talking about being raised from a life of sin. In fact, in Ephesians, the second chapter, he calls it being seated with him in heavenly places. That means living above a life of sin, living above the powers of darkness. Well, he went on to say something else to us. He said in the 6th verse of the 6th chapter of Romans in our last session, he said, knowing this, it is something we should know, that our old self was crucified with him. Most of us don't believe that. He's talking here by receiving this by faith. He tells us that in order we come to the right mind of Christ, that we will not continue to live and accept the imaginations and the thoughts of evil and wickedness. He said, knowing this, and he says it in a just rather a matter of factly way. He said that our old self was crucified with him. Now why did he tell us that? He tells you. He says that our body of sin may be done away with. Well, what do you mean by that, Paul? He tells you that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Is that verse also in your Bible, the sixth verse? Now you stop and think about that. So how can we come up with these doctrines of once saved, always saved, you can't lose it, no matter what evil you, you, you commit? It's ludicrous. And this is not something strange. You see, this doctrine began in the Garden of Eden. That's where it began. The doctrine of once saved, always saved did not begin in our generation. It did not even begin with the Calvinist. It began in the Garden of Eden. The Lord said to Adam, very clearly, I give you this responsibility. But the day that you eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall die. Now the Lord told him, gave him his word, and gave it to him while he was in a pure state, while he was a perfected man, while there was nothing of sin within his character of nature, while there was no darkness. He gave it to him when he was totally perfect. And then Satan comes along and says to him, you can eat that tree and you will not die. You won't lose your place. You'll always have the same place you got. In fact, you'll be wiser. Well, that's, that's what exactly what the doctrine of once saved, always saved is. It's an amplification. It's more colored. You, I don't know if you've noticed, if you can go back to the time that you was in high school, there was always cliches for evil and sin. Do you remember that? And then as you begin to hear the new generation, there's always new ways of saying it, more colorization of it. Satan is a master of changing words. And so he gives us the understanding that we are cool because we can talk jive talk. We can talk in a language that we understand among ourselves because we, we are something cool real in what's happening. But that's exactly what the doctrine of what saved always saved is. It's a colorization of God's word. Well, the sixth verse totally chops that doctrine to pieces. Knowing this, our old self 
was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should be no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died. Now, why did he say, for he who has died? He told you earlier that we have died with Christ. Is that right? Yes. He said, for he who has died is freed from sin. Are those words also in your Bible? Yes. Amen. Totally freed or acquitted from all sin. Now, in order that we understand just how this works, he says for us to do something. He says in verse in verse eleven, and verse eleven, I hope you got it painted in. It should be it should stand out more than any verse in that six that sixth chapter. And yet there's some more important verses in it. He said in verse eleven, even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin. But alive to God in Christ Jesus. Never see yourself that way, he's saying. Just consider yourself to be dead to sin. And we keep considering ourselves, oh, I can't overcome this sin. No, it's by our faith we overcome this world, everything of sin. Amen? He said, everything that is born of God overcomes this world. Well, after telling us that, he says, therefore, I'm going to sum it up for you, he's saying, of all that I've said to you so far, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. Say with me. No longer will sin live in me. No longer will sin live in me. I have the word of God. I have the word of God. My life is over. My life is over. The old me was crucified. The old me was crucified. And the life that I now live. And the life that I now live. I live with resurrection power. I live with resurrection power. To glorify Jesus. To glorify Jesus. See, he said, consider yourself to be dead to sin. Well, then in verse 14, he tells us something. He says, for sin shall not be master over you. For sin shall not be master over you. For sin shall not be master over you. Why? You're not under the law anymore. You see, the law was when we try to live in our own strength. And no man can keep the law. It's impossible. And we're going to find out why we can't, we can't keep it in a moment. That's what this seventh chapter is about. The seventh chapter is an amplification by Paul to let us know how evil we really are. I keep saying, what is this thing called flesh? Because whenever we hear that God said, don't do something, that's when we want to do something. It's just like the nature we see in children. God is saying something to us. Well, he says, but now you're under grace, which means you have all the strength of God available for you to see that you make it in. And you're going to see that. Now, he will bring that out very clearly uh, into the 8th chapter. We'll, maybe we won't make it there today, but we'll try. Well, he goes on to say something else to us. Verse 18, he says, having been free from sin, you became slaves of what? Righteousness. Righteousness. He says in verse 19, I'm speaking in human terms, because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, in that verse he told us something else. He said whenever you give in to sin, sin has a way of multiplying itself and possessing more of you and taking over the rest of your being and causes you to have an unquenchable thirst and an unquenchable desire to go back to that same sin over and over again and the more you give into it, the more it, it, it increases its grip on you and its power over you. That's what he says in verse 18. Look what he says. 19. He says, I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. The weakness of your flesh is, your flesh is a tendency to love sin more than it loves God. So that's the weakness of your flesh. He says, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity, the members is every part of your body, your hands, your eyes, your private parts, your nose, your mouth, whatever you used your, your parts for your members for. He says, and to lawlessness, that means breaking God's law, being in rebellion against God, resulting, he tells you, in further lawlessness. He says, so now, present your members as slaves to righteousness, Resulting in what? Sanctified. That's the big key. Sanctify. Resulting in sanctification. A process. Amen? And then he says in verse 22, But now, having been freed from sin, 
And he used another term. And enslaved to God. He said, you derive your benefit, circle the word benefit, put your pleasure and your enjoyment. You derive your benefit, that's pleasure and enjoyment, resulting in what? There it is again, sanctification. Now he tells us something. He says then the outcome, the outcome of what? Sanctification is eternal life. And suppose you're not sanctified, then there is no eternal life. That's only eternal damnation. And we'll see that very clearly. Now, when we go into the seventh chapter, he, he literally goes back to amplify something that he said to us about being free from sin. Chapter 7 begins with an illustration, with an example. I told you that Paul was very wordy. And when I carried you through the sixth chapter, I did not, on purpose, tell you about all the wordiness. And Paul wrote his wordiness as if it was something that we all understood. In fact, he used words from the time he gave us verse 14 to the time he closed verse 23. And so for you to get a better understanding of the seventh chapter, if we would cut out, and I'm, I'm, please don't cut it out, but I'm talking about only for this session. When you read verse 14, for you to have a sharper understanding of verse of chapter 7, you go directly from, chap, from verse 14 in the 6th chapter into his illustration, his example, his parable in the 7th chapter of Romans. Otherwise, you have no understanding what Paul is even talking about. Am I making myself clear? Do me a favor. Would you please read out loud verse 14 to me in your Bible in Romans 6. What does he say? For sin shall not be master over you. For sin shall not be master over you. Why? For you are not under the law. You catch that? You are no longer under the law. And we're going to see why we're no longer under the law. And we saw very clearly, if you remember the first previous five chapters, what was the purpose of the law? Does anybody remember? Schoolmaster. Schoolmaster. What else was it? To bring us to Christ? And what was the other thing? Show us ourselves. The purpose of the law was also to bring forth God's wrath and all sin and disobedience, remember? The purpose of the law was so that God would be justified in bringing forth his wrath to all rebellion and sin. And we saw that also in Romans, right? But let's continue. He says, for you're not under law, excuse me, but what are you under? Grace. You're under grace. Now, once you understand verse 14, now, now from verses 15, through verse 23, Paul writes that as a matter of fact, way, this should be something that you already knew and understood. It's a letter he's writing. And so he says to us, you should know these things. So, after saying to verse 14, let's move over into the first verse of chapter 7. He says, or do you not know, brethren? For I'm speaking of those who know the what? The law. law. Now, don't miss that. He's going to give us an illustration and an example. He just told them that they're no longer under the law. That means they must have, have understood the law and must have understood that they had a requirement to keep the law before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. So now he says, you are no longer under the law. Then he says, I'm speaking to those who know the law. That the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. Yes, they understood that. Amen? Amen. Amen? Notice this. They weren't like us. Thinking that once they're under grace, that they could go ahead and continue to commit sin. They understood that when they were under the law, that they were subject to the law every day of their lives. Or when they broke the law, they would suffer the consequences. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Amen. As I said to you, we're going to come to the seventh chapter. Now, every false teaching in all era has a tendency to do two things in us, all of us, and we've all gone through it. It will do away with all dying to sin, no cross, no suffering. All false teaching is designed for the pits of hell to put our hearts at ease and to cause us to live in constant rebellion against God while we feel secure. 
And all false teaching will always do away with the requirements of holiness, always. Righteousness and sanctification and purity, and it really teaches us, don't be so concerned about obedience. And they tell us these lies. There's no punishment. There's no judgment. Same teaching we saw in the Garden of Eden, Satan's teaching. That's what all false teaching is, is Satan's teaching. You won't die. You won't lose it. God's only love. Now, do you understand that Paul let them know, those who understood the law, that the law was over that person as long as they lived? Do you understand that? All right. Now he goes into verses 2 through verses 3 to give us an example of those who understood that the law was to be over their lives as long as they lived. And so he uses as an example something that is pure common knowledge to every living human being. And he says, and he didn't say for example, but if he had said for example, you might want to insert that word for example. That's what verses 2 and 3 is, are examples. For the married woman is bound by what? Law to who? Her husband while he's what? Living. He, what's his point? The law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. We just told us in verse 14, we're no longer under the law, but now we're under grace. Is that right? So he's going to teach us something. He's going to tell us about the hideousness of the law. And the law is good. We know that. Amen? Now watch what he says. The married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, why did he bring up the point if the husband dies? He's telling us we're no longer under the law, but now we're under grace. Right? He says, she is released from the law concerning the husband, which means once he dies, she's no longer married to him. Is that right? She's free from marriage because he's dead. He's gone. He's unexistent. Right? So then, he says, if while her husband is living, if her husband is still living, he says, and she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. Well, we all understand that. And he goes right back to the point again, and let me just say this to you. Remember, we began to study this book while they were trying to go back to the Jewish law. Do you understand he's telling them that if you have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and you're trying to keep the law that God calls you an adulteress? Now listen to what he says. And watch what happens. He says, But if her husband dies, she is free from the law. That means law of being married to her husband. So that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. So what is he saying? Once Jesus died for you, you are no longer trying to keep the law in the power of your own flesh. Now you have God's grace given to you. And when you begin to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, you will fulfill the requirements of the law. You find those words in the book of Galatians. That's how we keep the law. We have the requirement to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, and our neighbor as ourselves. He said the law is fulfilled in one word. Is that right? That's how we keep the law. It's a lifestyle. Then he makes another statement. He says, Therefore, he said, I'm going to sum up and explain to you what I've been saying to you. My brethren, you also were made to die to the law. Through what? The body of Christ. Have you been baptized into his body? Amen. Yeah. That you might be joined to who? Another. Well, who is that other person? He tells you. To him. That's right, to Jesus. Who was raised from the dead. And here's the whole purpose of why we're joined to Jesus. That we might bear fruit. Say it with me. I have a responsibility, have a responsibility. To, bear to bear fruit. To bear God's fruit. In other words, no more the fruit of the flesh. That's where Galatians 5 comes in. That's where Ephesians 4 comes in. Ephesians 5 comes in. Colossians 3 comes in. 
He talked about, we therefore are required to bear fruit. But let me say something to you. Before you came to God, we were bearing fruit. But we were bearing fruit for whom we were married to, and that was Satan. We, we, we walked in the fruit of anger, strife, rebellion, lust, fornication, adultery, everything that you can think of, uncleanliness. And so when Jesus said, you know, the tree by its fruit, well, let me put it this way. What you see in a life tells you what they're, who they're really joined to. Are oh, you listening to me? So he says, I'm going to read that again. That we might be joined to another. To him who was raised from the dead. That we might bear fruit for God. That's what he meant in Ephesians 5. He said, why when I've done all this for my vineyard, do they still produce worthless grapes? which means they continue to produce the fruit of the flesh. They totally make void the grace of God for their life. Say with me. I have the requirement, have the requirement. to consider myself to, consider to be dead to all sin. To be dead to all sin. Now, that's where we'll begin to look this morning because I want you to see three verses with me because in these three different I should say references, literally explains to us why we are to consider ourselves to be dead to sin and the consequences of still walking in sin. For example, in Romans 11 chapter, now mark your place, we're going to come back to Romans 6. Maybe not in this first session, but we're going to come back to it. In Romans 11 chapter, the Lord says to us concerning the law of God's judgment. And there are laws with God. And I think I can say that word without you getting confused. God has laws of righteousness that correspond to our laws of obedience to Him. God also has laws of judgment and damnation and destruction that corresponds to our laws of rebellion against Him and disobedience against Him. Is that plain and simple enough? Well, Romans 11 tells us about this law of rebellion and therefore God's judgment descending upon us at walk in rebellion and disobedience even though he's told me under grace we begin to read in the 18th verse he says don't be arrogant toward the branches but if you are arrogant remember that it is not you who supports the root but the root supports you the root is Jesus you will say then Branches were broken off so that I might be granted in. Verse 20, quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Don't be conceited, but fear. Folks, that wasn't some like statement he made. He said, you better fear and not be lifted and proud and think you come to a place of security. He said, but fear. I can tell you right now, no Calvinist would ever fear because they believe there's a special election. And they put it this way, they'll say, well... You know, he, went, he wrote over there about some elect that he had, and therefore, if it's for me to be saved, I'll be saved. If it's not, I won't. That's a lying doctrine. When it, the word predestined simply means God planned a purpose, and we've already seen Jesus give us a testimony of what God's planning purpose was. The Bible said he died for the sins of the whole world and not just an elect few. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Well, look what he goes on to say here. Why did he say fear? Why would Paul use such a word? He tells you in the very next verse. He goes right into it. He says, For if God did not spare the natural branches, would you read that next part loud, please? Neither will he spare you. What did God do with the natural branches? Catch them into the fire. He destroyed them. Is that right? Then he says to us, to remember this in verse 22, Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fail. What did they get? Severity, that means severe judgment. But to you, God's kindness, and then there's a stop sign. Yeah. What does a stop sign say? Yeah. Yeah. If. If you continue in his kindness, and, what, and what's the point he makes? Read the next part, read the next part to me. Otherwise, Otherwise, you also, that means you that's under grace, you also will be cut off. Yeah. Are those words also in your Bible? Yeah. See? He told us why we should fear. Well, you don't hear that teaching anymore. They say, well, God's love, don't worry about it. And when they say God is love, 
Yes, we know that God is love. We've seen that very clearly. That God is love to who? Those who love him. He said, but those who what are disobedient and they're begging, he said, I will repay them to their faces. Is that right? Yes. To cause them to perish quickly from the land. That's in your Bible, the seventh chapter of Deuteronomy. We've learned that. Well, when they say God is love, they simply mean that God won't destroy you if you walk in rebellion and disobedience. That's not what that means. In the 13th chapter of Romans, Paul writes again, and he says, this should be our attitude, not one of once saved, always saved. See, the, anybody that believes in once saved, always saved, I can tell you right now, they're not concerned about working out their salvation. They could care less about working out their salvation because when they bought the lie, when they ate the lie of once saved, always saved, I can tell you right now, they really were severed from Christ because they bought another gospel. And that's why Paul tells you that they preach, they trouble you, he says, by another gospel, and he says, which is really not another, which means they take the word of God and they twist it and give you another gospel. That's what the prosperity message is. It's another gospel. It's not the gospel. Are you listening to me? And so, that's what he's telling us in Romans 6. The 13th chapter, he says to us very clearly in the 11th verse, now, there are three words in that level. Verse are very important. And then there are the first three words. And what does he say in your Bible? He said, do this. I mean, you found be doing this. Knowing the time. But it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. The night is almost gone. And the day is at hand. Let us, therefore, he's still talking, we're going to salvation. Lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. But what's the armor of light? He's going to tell you in verse 14 what the armor of light is. He's going to tell you about the deeds of darkness and what our attitude should be. He says in verse 13, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing. That's what all you covered this dinners are. We were, Pastor Holmes and I rode back to church together yesterday evening. They spent the day with me between services and we're looking at one of these so-called spiritual churches on the side of the road down there that said, uh, sign up here for your church baseball leagues. Folks, it's not time to be playing baseball and softball. It's time to seek the face of the Lord, to redeem the time, to make up for the lost time we've, we've, we've wasted in God's kingdom. Amen? Amen? Souls perishing in hell by the thousands every second, and we're concerned about you know, having flesh fellowship and playing baseball. He says, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. He's describing here what it means to work out your salvation. Because everything I just read to you is seven times stronger than we are. Then he says in verse 14 about the armor of light, he says, well, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the armor of light, and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its what? Lust. So now we know what the flesh is. The flesh is a lust machine that we live in. And everything in this world is lust. Is that right? Yes. Now, one more place. Because we need to see this to understand what he's going to say to us in Romans 7. And Ephesians, the fifth chapter. Notice with me, please, verses 9 through verse 11. Because, did you just read over there in Romans 7 that we might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we may bear what? Fruit for who? For God. Is that right? That means his character, his nature. Now, we know what the fruit of God is. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, goodness, temperance, faith, faithfulness. When he said you know about their fruit, that's what he was talking about. We also have learned what the fruit of the flesh is. For you that don't know what the fruit of the flesh is, let me just read it to you right quick. You don't have to please don't turn there because I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not really teaching on this. We've learned this. But you can find the fruit of the flesh very clearly in your Bible, in Ephesians, excuse me, in Galatians, the fifth chapter, um, beginning at verse 19. And so I'm going to read the list. Immorality, 
All I'm reading is fruit of the flesh. If it's in your life, it's the wrong fruit. He said, we should be joined to another and to bear fruit for God. Here's the fruit of the flesh, the wrong fruit. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. We think all this, what sign were you born under? And mother rings and uh, all these things are. Enmity, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, and carousing. And things like these of which I forewarn you, Paul says, just I have forewarned you that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of who? Yeah. Of God. Well, then how can it be once saved, always saved, if this junk's in your life? He just say they won't go to heaven? They won't, that, the, in other words, does he just say to you that you have made your inheritance void? Yes. They will not inherit? Did he just say that to you? Yes. So how can it be once saved, always saved, when this junk's in your life, you're still doing these things? Now, in Ephesians, my point is about bearing fruit. See, I'm still giving the application all through the Bible of all of Paul's revelation, what it means to work out your salvation. Paul says in Ephesians 5, verse 9, he says, for the fruit of of the light. Did he say put on the armor of light? Yes. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Well obviously the fruit I just read to you or the flesh is not pleasing to the Lord. And then he says in verse 11, and do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of what? Darkness. But instead, even expose them. Well, that's the message of what Paul is going to tell us about in the seventh chapter of Romans. Now, before we go on, I want to go right back to the seventh chapter of Romans. Because this chapter will probably, I'll spend more time on the seventh chapter than any chapter in Romans. Because it's the chapter from which all the lies of Calvinism, a lot of them of Calvinism is based on. We've learned about those lies that Schofield brought to the body of Christ. And I mean, it's, it's, it's sad what has happened to the people of God these last days. I, I'm always mindful of how when Schofield first came out with his heresies and his lies, that the men of God of his day did not take him seriously and thought that the people of God would never buy this delusion. But what they never <laughs> foresaw was that the next generation would begin to buy his Bibles and uh, they would take, because they saw notes in the Bible as if it was really the truth, and begin to equate the words of a man to be equal to the words of God. Well, in the seventh chapter, I want to read this again. Now, this seventh chapter begins from the 14th verse of the 6th chapter, the 14th verse says, For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but you are under grace. Chapter 7. Or do you not know, brethren? For I am speaking of those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. He gave us the example in verse 2 and 3. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he's living. But if her husband dies, she is releasing the law concerning the husband. So then... If while her husband is living, she's joined to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. Verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ that you might be joined to another. That means the moment that you accepted Jesus, you were free to keep the law in the power of your own flesh. Then he says, to him who was raised from the dead that we might bear fruit to God. Romans 7, 1 through 4 is dying to the law of sin and death, dying to all rebellion, dying to all evil, knowing that we have been joined to another. Now, everything I'm about to show you from this point on, the time we have left in this first session, is Romans 7, verse 4. 
And let's just take a little journey through the Word of God and see how that Paul has laced every book he wrote with Romans 7, verse 4. Let's go first to 1 Peter and see what Peter said about it. In 1 Peter, the second chapter, I want you to notice with me what it means to be joined to another and being joined to him who was raised from the dead. Here again, Peter has the same spirit in him that Paul obviously had in him. Can you say amen? And he says to us very clearly, 1 Peter 2, verse 24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, and here's the part I want you to underline for this session, that we might die to sin. Are those words there? Yes. Amen. Yes, everything else in verse 24 is important, but for our part and our requirement, the most important thing in verse 24 is that we might die to sin. That's our part. Amen. The other part of verse 24 is describing God's part. God's done his part. But see, we're, we're interested today for chapter 7 of Romans. What is our part and what does God require of us? That we might die to sin. And the other part is what God will do when we die to sin. Amen? Amen. And live to righteousness. Did Paul tell us that we're free from the law of sin and death to live to righteousness? Mm-hmm. That we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Then he says, for by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. In 1 Corinthians 7, he's still talking about dying to sin, joined to another, bearing fruit for God. Here he's talking about doing, being doers of the word. 1 Corinthians 7, just one verse there. Notice with me, please, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 19. Here Paul writes again by the Holy Spirit. And remember, we begin looking at the book of Romans, how the Judaizers had come down and told them they had to be circumcised. Is that right? Yes. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 19. He says, circumcision is what? Nothing. Nothing. And uncircumcision is what? Nothing. Nothing. But what matters is, what matters is what? The keeping of the commandments of God. Is that plain in your Bible? What is he talking about? Dying to sin, bearing fruit for God. Keeping the commandments of God is how we bear fruit for God. Is that right? Well, that's not something new. Let me show you. Way in the Old Testament, God hasn't changed his mind. Go to Ecclesiastes for a moment. Let me show you. The last chapter when Solomon, remember what Solomon did. He backslid. He fell. In fact, we don't know whether Solomon made it to heaven. There's there's two characters in the Bible that most of us that are Bible teachers have really wondered about. It's Solomon and Jonah. Because we read that Jonah, literally, the last thing we read about him was he told God he had a right to be angry. I think it's taking 44 minutes. Let's tell me now. I think this records a different record. It records some longer. The thing that we saw was Solomon, he fell. And Jonah, when you read the last part of the, the third chapter of Jonah, I think it's the fourth chapter of Jonah, three or four chapters, I can't remember which. He told God he had a right to be angry. And we saw Paul tell us very clearly in Ephesians 5, anger don't make it. Galatians 5, anger don't make it. Ephesians 4, anger don't make it. Is that right? Right. So we wonder whether those two made it. I'm not saying that Jonah didn't repent later. We just know it's according to the Bible. There's no recorded place he ever repented from his anger. Now, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon literally writes for us in that book the foolishness of pursuing all the things of this world and this life and being caught up in expending energy, going after riches and to amass riches. And he used the word vanity, 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 vanity. All is vanity, vanity, vanity. That means everything on this ram is vanity. Whenever you find the word vanity, it's put loss of inheritance. So he's going to tell us what he learned. Thank God he wrote it for us. In the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes in the 13th and the 14th verse, he says, and by the way, 
uh, there is a madness in the body today. I know when I was up in different places, everybody was always talking about writing books. That way you get to be known. And it was always a mad rush to write a book. And I, I can't speak for other men, but I can tell you this now. God has never told me to write a book. I don't plan to write any. And um, in that 12th chapter, he tells you about the writing of many books is endless and excessive devotion to books is wearing to the body. Yes. But, but I'm going to zero in on 13 and 14. He's going to sum up everything he wrote. He says the conclusion, when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to who? Every, every person. For God will bring every act to what? Judgment. judgment. Don't miss that word judgment. Everything which is hit, hidden, whether it is good or evil. Are those words in your Bible? Yes. Well, see, so I'm still talking about what Paul's talking about there in Romans 7 verse 4. Because when we start reading this part about him finding himself not doing the things that he wanted to do, folks, it wasn't because he was trying to stay in that state and therefore preach that type of gospel and said, therefore, you're justified when you're falling from grace or when you're committing acts of rebellion and disobedience. He was saying, I'm telling you, that's all he's saying to us, how difficult it was for me to cause my mind to be renewed and to begin to live to fulfill the mind of Christ. And when I want to do the things of God, I found that I wasn't able to do it because my flesh is a lust machine. That's all he was saying to us. And everything in this world is lust. Amen? We use the word lust. We're not just talking about just sexual lust. We're talking about lust for anything on this earth. Well, again, did he say that we were baptized into Christ and that we would be joined to another? Would you go to 1 Corinthians 6? Let me show it to you there. First Corinthians 6, verse 9. He begins by saying to us, Or do you not know that the unrighteous, that we learn in 1 John 3, that the unrighteous are those that practice unrighteousness. Is that right? Right. So he tells us about those that's practicing unrighteousness. So how do you you come with a Calvinistic doctrine of once saved, always saved? You know, there's a brother that used to attend, I shouldn't even call him a brother, he's an enemy of God. I should call him what the Bible calls him. Uh, The Bible in Philippians 3 calls him him a dog and calls him an enemy of the cross. And uh, he should come with... uh, uh, Jim and Crystal, I think I know who Crystal is. And uh, they all come out of that doctrine of once they've always saved in Calvinism. And uh, he got involved in adultery and everything else, and the Lord had me call him one day, and I was calling about some books, and he was terrified because God had told, told me what he had been doing. And so, you know, I told him, I said, where have you been? He said, I fell from God. He told me what had happened to him. I said, brother, you come back to God. You, you, you run out of that situation. You come back to God. And because he wanted to hold on to his doctrine of once saved, always saved, what he's doing now, he's now writing a book to, to prove that he can commit sin and still keep his salvation. And it, 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 is, it is madness. I mean, just literally madness. You know, I mean, if you fall in sin, folks, and you fall in adultery, because it happened to any of us, we're flesh, you know what I mean? We don't want to justify, we don't want to run from, we want God to cut that junk out of us. And I said to myself, how many other souls will this man snare? In other words, he's become now an agent of Satan. Will he snare by reading that book and give them justification when they commit evil? No wonder God won't let me read books. This is what he says. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. I don't care how much you say once saved, always saved. Don't be deceived. Amen. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. And by the way, the word effeminate is not even homosexuals. They just act prissy. You know what I mean? <laughs> Don't miss that. Nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. So how do you get out of that once saved, always saved? 
I'm not condemning. There was a brother here last night. When he walked in, I assured him, I said, this brother needs to be different from homosexuality, doesn't he? That's when I begin the service, you'll be bound every unclean spirit. Know what comes among you. Ask God to give you eyes to see. I'm not condemning the brother. Pray for the brother. This is what he says in verse 11. Such were some of you. I'm sure that we could all read this list and find something in there that fit us in the past. Such were some of you. Then he says, but you were washed. Washed how? In his blood. Is that right? Yeah. But you were sanctified. Notice the word sanctified. But you were justified. Did Paul tell us that we were, he was raised for our justification? Remember what we read in the fourth chapter, in the fifth chapter of Romans? That Jesus was raised up for our justification. You were justified, which means no matter what you were in this list, that when you accepted Jesus, he raised you up with him and said he's justified. Or she's justified. You were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Are those words also in your Bible? Now, after telling us that, would you drop down, please, to verse 15? And I said to myself, I wonder if this guy that's writing this book knew about verse 15. He says in verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Now, you stop and think about that. Every body part that you have on your being has now become a part of Christ Jesus. Shall I then take away the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? And he says, may that never be your attitude. Well, this guy's going to write a book on once saved, always saved. That's his attitude. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her? Well, I can tell you this too. That happens when you join a harlot church. I was part of a harlot church. For he says, the two shall become one flesh. What's his point? Yeah, we should know these things. What's your point, Paul? The point is verse 17. But the one who joins himself to who? Yeah. The Lord. Did we just read in Romans 7 that we're to be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we might bear fruit from God? For he, he said, for the one who joins himself to the Lord. Is one spirit with him. One spirit. Not walking in there begging with the, with the declaration on your, your tongue as a lying serpent. I can't lose no matter what I do. I told you before about when we were in New York about this man coming out with a pro, two pro, two of them, not one, two prostitutes on his arm, staggering drunk. And so I was passing out tracts and said, Yeah, I, I, I'm a Christian too. And I remember me and the two girls and someone who was with us said, what, you're a Christian? Well, haven't you heard? He's one thing to always say. God don't see my sin, he just sees the blood. He said, bro, you're on your way to hell. Well, you can't lose your salvation. I prayed the sinner's prayer. What an abomination. There's Titus 1.16. They profess to know God about their deeds of denying. They profess to know God. That's what he says. Because we understand that, he says to us in verse 18, flee. The word flee means to run from in terror. Whenever you find the word flee, it means to run away from in terror. Run away from in terror. I remember when I got saved that that was a star basketball player for Wheatley High School, and he and I should run together and play ball together. We were good for one another. And uh, his name was James Walden. And I remember when... Uh, we had learned these scriptures, and of course, you know, when you're young, many times that you're still fighting temptations, sexual temptations, and we, we saw this scripture, we discovered it, and 
So we had made a pact that if we ever got in a situation, we would flee and run from in terror. And I'll never forget, one day he came running to my house. He was panting and was out of breath. And I said, James, what's the matter? He said, brother, I just had to flee fornication. And we, were, we had King James Bibles. And I think, so I heard you about us to sleep fornication, doesn't it? Yes. And I remember, I said, you had to, what, what happened? Well, he was a good student also. And he, uh, this girl invited him over to help in her algebra homework, which was a pretense. And so he was trying to help with her homework. And she was just all over. He kept moving away from her. He had gotten saved, you know. And so... She called him in the next room, and there she was, totally unrolled. And he said, he said, two thoughts went through his mind. This girl, and then the other thought, he heard the scripture. That voice said, flee fornication. He said, he said, I stopped, and I heard that voice, and I just turned and just ran out of the house, the door wide open, and kept running. And I mean, he must have run five miles. And I said, pray, that's what I said. I said, praise the Lord, brother. Praise the Lord, brother. That's what I said to him. And of course, the report went out of the next day at Phyllis Whitney High School that James Walton had to be queer. It was spread everywhere. He had to be queer. Yes, he did. <laughs> I said he wasn't queer, he was peculiar. God's people are peculiar. Amen? Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the, but the immoral man sins against his own body. Or do you not know, he says, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God? And please don't miss this verse, and that you are not your own. Say with me, I don't belong to myself anymore. Therefore, Therefore I, cannot live Therefore, I cannot live my life, my life and do what I want to do. I'm not the property of my master, who is God. I'm just a slave. I've been bought. That's why he saved your slaves of righteousness. And guess what? A slave has no rights to do what he wants to do. He's bound to his master. But he says in verse 20, For you have been bought with a price, therefore... Glorify God in your body. I can tell you right now, anybody that believes in once saved, always saved, do not live to glorify God in their body. Everything I'm showing you is still Romans 7, verse 4. In John 17, did he just say they were one spirit with him? Okay. Uh, let me show you this prayer that Jesus prayed. We call this his prayer. Um, this is a real Lord's Prayer. John 17. It's called the Priestly Prayer, too, isn't it? Yes. There's a statement that Jesus makes in verse beginning at verse 16 there. I want you to notice it with me. John 17, beginning at verse 16. He's describing those of us who he has purchased in his blood. He's describing those of us who are one spirit with him. He's describing those of us who are supposedly joined to the Lord who say with our tongues that we are his disciples. And here's what he tells God about us. You see, he ever lives to make an accession for us. He ever lives to speak in our behalf. And it says in the 16th verse, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. That's why we're in the word. You might not realize it, but we're being sanctified. We're being sanctified in the word, by the word, by the spirit. Sanctify them in the truth, in the truth, and he tells what the truth is, thy word is truth. Verse 18, he says, as thou didst send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. That's why we go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. Just like God sent him into the world to seek and to say that which was lost, he now gives us the same charge. We are sent out into the world to also seek and to say that which is lost. And as slaves, we cannot tell God the excuse, I don't feel like it. 
I'm too tired, I'm too old, I'm too young, I'm too black, I'm too white, I'm too male, I'm too female. There are no excuses. Then we come to the next verse. Then he says in verse 19, And for their sakes, I sanctify myself. What does he mean? He sanctify himself. That's exactly right, Terry. He lived it. He lived only to do the word, will of God and the word of God. That they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. I don't ask in behalf of these alone but for those also who believe in me through their word. And that's what's happened to us. We're believing in God through the word that the disciples wrote to us. Yes. See, before we were believing the words of man. Yes. See, I can't wait. I hope I have time to get to this. Oh, dear God, this session is flying by. But you're going to learn what he meant when he said about removing our hearts far from him. See, we ignore that part that, that makes little sentence that says, they teach for doctrines, the commandments of men. The words of man don't sanctify. Yeah. Amen. The words of man sends to hell. Amen. And that's what we're eating, the words of man. This is what he says. He said, I'm also making intercession for those who will believe in us through their word. In verse 21 he says that they all may be what? One. one. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Amen. That they all may be one even as thou Father art in, me, art in me and I in thee that they also may be in us. I can tell you right now, if you walk in the rebellion, with your doctrine once saved, always saved, you're going to see that the slave of sin is kicked out of the house. They're kicked out. Kicked out. That's why I gave you that teaching last about the angel. That angel, the seraphim, is designed to keep you out. If there's not one thing you can do about it, except repent. And pray that God grant you repentance. That's what he says. That they, they, they may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me. That means God is one in Jesus, and I in thee, and I'm in Jesus, and I'm one in God. And that they also may be in us, that we may be one also. That the world may believe that thou didst send me. Are those words also in your Bible? In Galatians, the second chapter, Paul describes this type of relationship. And he says in Galatians 2, notice with me please, verse 17. Galatians 2, verse 17. See, how can we even eat the lie of what they have told us Romans 7 meant unless we get the clarification of what Romans 7 means? You know, there was an Assembly of God preacher in, um, I once preached this church in Big Stone Gap, Virginia, and... Uh, when we went there, we could tell the man was immoral, and he was had a wife and a family, but he was involved in all type of other sexual relationships. And, and the Lord told us we knew. And um, recently, he called me about oh six months back, and uh, he said, "Brother, he said I'm to the place. He said I'm almost convinced that it's impossible for me to be saved." I said, brother, you can be saved once you make up your mind to turn from your evil ways. And I didn't know that I knew all the time what he had been involved in. He said, how did you know? I said, brother, when we walked in, God told us both. I said, but God didn't tell us to tell you. And he said, but see, brother, the things, I'm doing the things I don't, don't really want to do. And I said, brother, you have bought the lie of the perversity of how Romans 7 was perverted. I said, your strength is in Romans 6. The deliverance is in Romans 6. He said, but that, that's Romans 7. Did Paul say that? I said, yes, brother. I said, I'll send you these tapes on Romans 6. And I did. Never heard from him since. 
Never heard from him since. Galatians 2, that's what it says in the 17th verse. But if, let's stop with two stop signs back to back. Stop sign, stop sign. But, stop sign, if, stop sign. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found what? Sinners. Comma. Question is asked. Is Christ then a minister of sin? No. No. And he says again, may that never be your attitude. How in the world could we have ever bought once saved, always saved? <laughs> Let's continue. For if I rebuild, what is he rebuilding? A life of sin. If I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law that I might live to who? God. Are those words also in your Bible? Um, Let me ask you a question. What is that law he's talking about, the first word? For through the law, I die to the law. What is that first law? That's it. The spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Well, since she got it, we'll have to turn to and read it, brother. I just knew you wouldn't get that one. That I might live to God. Then he just clarifies it. I have been crucified with Christ. What is he doing? He's reckoning himself dead to sin. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me and I don't nullify the grace of God. Is that in your Bible? Because I live in a life that does not nullify the grace of God. Romans 8. Romans 8. And uh, since you got it right, uh, we'll get to Romans 8 because probably in the next Bible school session. We'll continue to look at Romans, probably. But the first two verses is for only for those people who are dying to sin with everything they got in them. And therefore, there's no condemnation of those that's in Christ Jesus. For the law, 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 that's the law. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. You understand that now? But I want you to notice within please verse 13 of Romans 8. That's why I turn there. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. What do you must die to? The flesh. That's right. Beautiful. You must die to the flesh. And I can tell you right now, as you drive these roads and these highways to get to church, you find your flesh trying to be pulled to every type of temptation you can think about. Your mind tries to wonder on you. I'm going to remind you again, evil imagination and thoughts is living to please the flesh. As we said in Genesis, 
He said, man's imagination is continually evil. I'm sorry I ever made man. If you're living according to flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will what? Live. Live. Now, let me say this to you. There's not a Calvinist that believes, verse 13. They may tell their mouth they believe, they're liars. And their father is the father of lies. Because he tells you in verse 14, for all, does your Bible say for all? Yes. All. Who are being led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. Let me ask you. What are the sons of God doing? What is the Spirit leading them all to do? <laughs> to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Not writing books on once saved, always saved. And special election. That's what it means to live by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God, the Bible says, Jesus told us, when he comes, he will convict us of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. And so what does the Spirit of God do? He comes to you and says, that is sin, Todd. Don't do it anymore. And Todd says, yes, Lord. That is sin. Victor, don't do that no more. Yes, Lord. Help me, Lord. Give me the grace to not do it anymore, Lord. Lord, I can't do it in my own flesh, Lord. I can want to not do it, Lord. Help me, Lord. You say I'm under grace, Lord. Put it to death in me, Lord. All will be led by the Spirit of God. These are the sons of God. Not those that spot in their doctrines once saved, always saved. And then he says in verse 15, for you have not received a spirit of slavery. What is that slavery there? Slave to sin. Slave to sin. You haven't received a, a spirit of slavery to sin. Leading to fear again. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons. By which we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Here we come to verse 17. And don't miss this because he said earlier about being joined to Christ. And if children, that means children of God, not children of the, of the devil. Does he say children of God? Talk to me. Yes. I'm going to read this verse to you. I'll tell you what I'm reading in a few moments. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone, anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Anyone who's not living to practice righteousness is not of God. Period. That's 1 John 3. I read to you first of all, verse 7, then verse 10 and 8, verse 5. And then in verse 9 it says, No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed, that's God's word, abides in him and he is able to sin not because he's born of God. Is that clear? Yes. Let's go back to Romans 8. And if children, that means children of God, that means the children of God are practicing righteousness, is that right? They put the death into the flesh. Heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs, that means join with Christ, with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, and we know what that suffering is. Paul was suffering in Romans 7 when he said it. The things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. He was suffering. And he tells us in 1 Peter 4, we don't arm ourselves with the same mind. And we'll see that. He says, if indeed we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. Are those words also in your Bible? Yes. 
in John 12, Jesus tells us again why he came and died. And it's not so we can remain in sin under some damnable heresy. I call them this cultic almost. Once saved, always saved. How dare we make fun of Jehovah's Witnesses to have such a hideous doctrine as that? In Romans 12, 46, Jesus says, I have come as light into the world that everyone, not just a few elect few, everyone who believes in me may what? Not remain in darkness. Are those words in your Bible? In John 7, According to earlier, let's look at it for the sake of the tape and those who receive our tapes. In John 7, the Lord writes again in the 34th verse and he says, John 8, excuse me, 34 to 36. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Everyone who commits sin has a different master has a different owner. He's a slave of sin. And the slave, that means a slave of sin, does not remain in the house, what does he say? Forever. forever. And he compares the slaves and sons. The son does remain forever. If therefore, the son shall make you free, that's why you read when Paul says, who shall deliver from this body of death? He'll tell you, we'll get to that verse. If therefore the Son shall make you free, you shall be free what? Indeed. You shall be free indeed. Are those words there? In Galatians 4, go there please. See, everything I'm showing you is what Paul's talking about when he begins to write Romans 7, and we look at the first four verses. Galatians 4, let's look at verse 27. See, what I'm, the reason I'm doing this to you folks, I'm giving you too many scriptures on purpose. I'm using what's called overkill. I'm using the beating of the water on the rocks because I want you to see what a twisted perversion and how many scriptures they had to ignore to come with a damnable heresy like once they'd always say. That's why I showed you yesterday about this scripture about they use no man can take out of the Father's hand. What a damnable lie they've gotten out of something so pure and perfect as God's word. But the one who has an evil heart, all things are evil, isn't it? Yes. But in Galatians 4.27, he says, Rejoice, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. Don't miss this part. More all the children of the desolate. That means the one that's lost than of the one who has a husband. Did Paul give us an example about the law of a husband being married to another? Is God our husband? Yes. Yes. Remember that scripture in Isaiah that a lot of times we've used in error, but it's okay, I guess, to use that way because you're not trying to sin with it. But yes, if a woman's husband dies, the Lord is her husband. But if your husband's alive, the Lord is still your husband. And the Lord is all our husband. We're the bride of Christ, are we not? Yes. He told you right there that the children of a desolate one, that's Satan, or be more than the one that has God as a husband. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. But as at that time, the one who was born according to the flesh, is not talking about a natural birth, talking about a spiritual birth, one that is a spiritual birth of the flesh. Persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it is now also. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman, that's one of bondage and sin, and her son, 
for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of who? The free, the free woman. woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of a bondwoman, but of the what kind of woman? Free the free woman. In those words in your Bible. Yes. That means we're not to be children of sin. <laughs> Is that right? In Galatians 5, 16, notice with me, please, again. Paul says, but I say, uh, what's that word there? Walk. walk. What does walk mean? Lifestyle. Fruit and deed, lifestyle, your everyday practices. Walk by the Spirit. That means be under control of the Spirit. And you won't carry out the desire of the flesh. Are those words there? Amen. For the flesh, he tells you about this lust machine that we're all born of, sets its desire, sets its will. That means stubbornness. Lately has made its mind. It's not going to give in. The flesh is our enemy. Sets its desire against the spirit. That means the will of the spirit of God. And the spirit also, in a way of stubbornness and determined to, to, to fulfill God's will, it sets its desire against the flesh. That means everything in the flesh, the spirit comes against it. For these are in opposition to one another. So here you are, born of the spirit, and there's a war going on within. Paul's going to describe that war. So that you may not do the things that you please, which means we don't live to please our flesh anymore. We're living now to please the Spirit of God. Is that right? Yeah. For if you are led by the Spirit, that means led by the Spirit of God, you're not under the law. The law's a curse, isn't it? That we've learned that. And then, of course, he names all the things which are of the flesh. We looked at that earlier, the wrong kind of fruit. But I want you to skip on down and look at something with me, please. Verse 24 and verse 25. Who belongs to Christ? You're going to tell you who belongs to Christ. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have done what to the flesh? Crucified, Crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. What is the flesh? He just told you. Passions and desires. I remember when I was in nursery school, we used to have this thing about the say, uh, what the little girls made of? Sugar and spice and all things are nice. What are the boys made of? Snakes and snails and puppy dog tails. What is the flesh made of? Passions and lustful desires. That's what we're made of. That's what the flesh is. It's a passion machine, a lust machine, all kind of craving machines. Got to have it machine. I've seen people get two jobs because they set their eyes and their desires on a big house they can't afford. They'll get two or three jobs and work overtime. What's, what's happening? They are satisfying their flesh. Doesn't matter what it costs them, their flesh will not have what they want. He says in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Are those words also there in your Bible? I'm still talking about Paul's talking about in Romans 7, verse 4 being joined to another. In 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter 2, let's look at verse 20 please. For all you once saved, always savers. I don't know if there's none here, pray tell. Let me show you this. Here's a guy, he's saved. That's what this verse is about. He got saved. He came to grace. He came to salvation. Here's a warning, verse 20. For, there's a stop sign, if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He said, if they are again entangled in them and are overcome, them there are the defilements of the world and are overcome, overcome there, are overcome by the cravings and the passions of the world. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. It has happened to them according 
to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit. Now you might call that man a dog. Because I learned later that when he had gotten saved, he had been saved out of pornography and lust. And he goes back and picks up just a woman of the world in a grocery store and they get involved in this hideous act because he holds on to this doctrine. Once saved, always saved. So he's writing a book now. The true problem's right there. There's the word of God on it. Is it there? Yes. A dog returned to its own vomit. That's what that picture means right there on the wall. That's why it's there. We were the dogs. It means very friendly, very personable. He's a nice man. There are lots of nice men in hell. He returns to his own vomit. And a sow, a sow is a pig. After washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. You ought to see how those pigs love to play in fill. I mean, and, and when it stinks, and I ask myself, big as their nose, don't they smell it? <laughs> now let me show you this. Go to Philippians for a moment. You wonder why you've had to wrestle with different ones that you've been called in brothers and sisters who keep going back to the same sins? Let me tell you, you've been playing with a doggy, an oinker, a pig. In Philippians 3, what does Paul say in the second verse? Beware. Beware of who? The dog. You talk about poodles and chihuahuas and snazzers? No, I'm talking about people that claim they came to Jesus and love Jesus. So beware of those dogs. Beware of the evil workers. He calls them evil workers. He calls them evil workers. He calls them dogs and evil workers. He said, beware of them. You know, have you ever uh, saw a sign on a person's yard that said, bad dog? Mm -hmm. and, and did it say, beware of bad dog? Did it say that? Right. And what did that sign mean to you when you saw it? Is dangerous. And and do what you says there? Stay away from it. Stay away from them. Don't come near them. You might get bit. We're going to stop and break. And begin there after the break.